Good afternoon. It's Tuesday. It's 1 p.m. Eastern, and welcome to Advancement Live. Advancement Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network, a series of professional development web shows and podcasts which are always free and accessible to you in our archives at higheredlive.com and on iTunes. Be part of our broadcast by tuning in live and sharing your insights and questions using the Higher Ed Live hashtag on Twitter. You can receive weekly updates with live show dates and times by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. I'm your host, Andrew Gosen. Big data. You've probably heard the term. In fact, it's a term that it's been hard to miss recently, since it's been being talked about extensively in the press and in the blogosphere. If we're being honest about it, it's probably a little bit of a buzzword right now. But just because it's a buzzword does not mean that it is all hype. In today's show, we're going to dive into the what big data is, as well as its implications, with a guest who is known for his ability to speak simply and clearly and convincingly about complex topics. I'm going to introduce Phil Simon in just a minute, but first I want to give a shout out to our Advancement Live sponsors, iModules and M Stoner. iModules is the leading constituent engagement software management provider for educational institutions. iModules delivers an integrated online platform that transforms how institutions strengthen constituent relationships and achieve fundraising success. iModules, thanks for your support. We couldn't do this without you. And Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with educational institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. And now, let's get down to it. For decades, advancement shops have served their institutions very well by extracting maximum value from a very limited set of data. We've worked effectively with data points related to student experiences of alumni, class year, degree type, area of study, extracurricular activities, and so on. And we've supplemented that data with data about giving and engagement history, as well as information from third party sources about things like giving capacity. Taken together, these data points make possible some basic audience segmentation and a certain amount of targeted engagement and solicitation strategies. As I noted a second ago, we have done very, very well with this limited information. However, one of the most dramatic aspects of the digital revolution has been an explosion in data. With over 40% of the world's population active online, there is now an unprecedented amount of information available to organizations. A 2013 report from The Economist reviews research suggesting that fully 90% of the world's data has been created in the past two years, and that the volume of data held by companies has grown by a factor of 1,000 over the past decade. There is no sign that this growth rate is flattening out at all. So there's more data, and more is usually interpreted as better. But it's not quite so easy. The kind of data that we're talking about here is vastly different from the highly structured, relatively static data that our business infrastructure and processes are built around. To take full advantage of this, we may need to unlearn habits that have served us well over the years, as well as learn new habits that are going to position us to take maximum advantage of this opportunity. We are lucky to be joined today by someone who's ideally positioned to help us think through what big data is, what the opportunity looks like, and what the challenges are that are associated with moving in this direction. Phil Simon is a sought-after speaker and recognized technology expert based out of Las Vegas, Nevada. He consults companies on how to optimize their use of technology, and has written six books. These include Too Big to Ignore, The Business Case for Big Data, and a just published follow-up entitled The Visual Organization, Data Visualization, Big Data, and the Quest for Better Decisions. His contributions have been featured in Harvard Business Review, CNN, Inc. Magazine, The New York Times, Wired, NBC, CNBC, The Huffington Post, Fast Company, ABCNews.com, Forbes.com, Business Week, Read Write Web, and many other high-profile media outlets. He holds degrees from Carnegie Mellon University and Cornell University. And Phil, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Andrew, thank you for having me. So to start with, I'd like to keep things very basic and not make any assumptions about how familiar our audience is with big data. Um, could you give us a quick overview of what it is and why you think it's so hot right now? Yes. When most people think of data, Andrew, as you pointed out before, they think of basically something that you could represent in Excel or in a database table. And that could be a list of employees, a list of sales, a list of transactions. 
that's still very important. Big data, however, represents almost the antithesis of that. In other words, rather than the small structured data, typically internal to an enterprise, stored in relational databases, we're talking about large amounts of unstructured or semi-structured data. For instance, an email is data. A YouTube video is data. A blog post is data. A tweet is data. Not to mention all of the metadata or data about data. In other words, within every individual tweet, there are 31 pieces of metadata associated with it. Time of tweet, location of tweet, any hashtags, length of tweet. Also, if that tweet has been banned in any countries, if that ban um, applies to any sort of copyright infringement. So there's a lot going on, even with a simple tweet of 140 characters. So that's big data in a nutshell, and it's growing exponentially. And even though most of it is noise, there is, in fact, a signal in that noise. And companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Netflix, Twitter are very good at finding the signal in that noise. As for why it's important, I think you hit on it yourself a few minutes ago. Organizations typically have done respectable jobs, some better than others, with that small data. But, in fact, they can only tell part of the story. And I would argue an increasingly less relevant part of that story. There are things that your customers or donors, in your case, are doing that aren't necessarily capable of being represented in nice Excel spreadsheets. So at a very high level, that's big data, and that's why it matters more and more. So could you talk to us a little bit about the three Vs that you discuss in your book and that are usually cited when we talk about what big data is? Um, volume, variety, and velocity? Yeah, when I was researching the book, I came across the work of Doug Laney, who works over at Gartner. He's a vice president of, I believe, uh, Innovation. He actually endorsed my most recent book. And he described, I think, five, six years ago, these three Vs. First up, there is a greater variety of information than ever before. And this isn't simply internal enterprise data. This could be data from social channels. This could be metadata. This could be content on blog posts. This could be called detail records, web logs, all sorts of different sources of data, a greater variety. There's also a greater volume. There's just more of everything. If you look at the amount of data, as you pointed out, 80 to 90 percent of it has been generated, uh, they say, in the last two years, and that trend shows no signs of abating. And as for the velocity, things are streaming at us faster than ever. We are coming up on the, for instance, eight-year anniversary of Jack Dorsey's first tweet, just setting up my Twitter, and now we hit something like 15 billion tweets a year, upwards of around 400 million a day. And the record, I believe, was just set for retweets with Ellen's selfie photo for the Oscars. Uh, 780,000 times that day, and I think it's up to about 3.4, 3.5 million, and that's one tweet. So there is a, a greater velocity of data. And as I described in the last two books, even though data streaming at us faster than ever, and there's more of it. Fortunately, there are tools that I'm sure we'll talk about a bit later that enable individuals and organizations to actually do something with that information. And no longer are we left with only static tools that can handle a finite amount of data. The tools out there now have progressed to the point at which plenty of companies are actually doing something with it beyond just storing it. They're actually analyzing it and then finding insights. So let's spend a little bit more time digging into the three Vs because it feels to me like, like each of those has an axis of opportunity as well as an axis of challenge. Yes. Now starting off with, with variety. I mean, depending on, on whose statistics you take as, as authoritative, there are, and thinking here about uh, sort of social media monitoring tools, th tools things like Radian 6 and Meltwater Engage, they're telling us that on a daily basis they're pouring through 200, 300, 400,000 different sources of, potential sources of information for information that relate to a particular search you have configured. And it, it's always struck me that one of the, the real challenges associated with the social web especially is how the variety of potential data sources is pretty staggering. But what that variety looks like actually changes considerably on a daily basis. So it, it's not like you just have a, a broader set of places you need to look. You need to keep tabs on how that ecosystem is evolving to be able to stay on top of, of the data that's out there. Absolutely. Two to three years ago, Andrew, and I think we spoke about this during our um, podcast we did uh, when we first got to know each other, a company started to get their arms around data from social sources like LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook, and then all of a sudden, a couple years ago, Pinterest comes out of nowhere. And I spoke with many people who said, now I've got to worry about Pinterest. Uh, when is it enough? Well, 
I, I can't say that Pinterest matters to you or doesn't, but if you look at Pinterest's engagement numbers, they're actually very compelling. So you're right, new data sources come out of nowhere, and you can't necessarily say that 20, we should care about 25% of Pinterest data, we should spend 18% of our time on Facebook. I always tell organizations in my consulting practice, uh, experiment with it if you find that it doesn't matter because you sell wheelchairs to people who are 70 years and older, and those people, as a general rule, aren't on Facebook, then you don't necessarily have to worry about that. However, if you think about the people who may be buying wheelchairs, they may be younger, and they may be on Facebook. So you don't really know. Um, I do think that it's becoming increasingly difficult to predict what's going to happen. Because of that, we have to consume as much data as possible and analyze it. We have to be open to it. I think that it's dangerous for us to summarily dismiss a data source because we just don't think it matters. I would argue that we don't know until we actually look at it and perhaps run it through an algorithm or run some sort of statistics against it. It may be very possible that it doesn't matter, but in my view, we don't know until we look at it. In the book, I, in the last two books, really, I've impressed upon people the need for data discovery. Um, if you think that you only need to look at three factors, you may be right, but what about more factors? As I said, it's just increasingly difficult to predict the future. Um, we need to embrace these new tools and beyond that, a mentality of, of discovery and, and really curiosity. It also sounds like you're suggesting that what may be valuable for one organization is not necessarily what may be valuable for another. So it's not like we can say, okay, here's a set of accepted best practices that we're now going to apply. You actually need to roll up your sleeves and do the homework yourself. Absolutely. One size fits all, and organizations' mileage may vary. And even with regard to some of the more technical tools like Hadoop, there isn't a standard stack. That's very different if you were deploying an enterprise resource planning tool or a customer relationship management tool. You could debate whether you should go with SAP or Oracle or another system, but the architecture was typically pretty understood. Uh, you didn't really need to be that creative. With something like Hadoop, there actually really isn't a standard stack, and a tool that may be useful for company X may not be useful for company Y. Companies like Netflix and Quantcast that I profiled in the most recent books have actually built their own tools because they took a look at what was out there and they said, this doesn't meet our needs, so we're going to build something that does. It feels as though an additional dimension of complexity that's associated with the Variety V is that not only are there suddenly many more sources for information than we've ever had before, but the types of data coming out of each of those sources vary considerably. Um, and what I mean by that is that initially we were focused primarily on text-based types of data, such as a tweet, such as a status update on Facebook. And all of a sudden, as more and more video is out there, as you've got Vine, as you've got these, these platforms like um, Snapchat that are predicated on, on anonymity, although obviously that's not bulletproof anonymity, uh, it feels like like the the sort of tree of potential different types of data is expanding pretty dramatically as we as we get deeper into this new world. Yeah, text was and will continue to be important. I'd also throw numbers in there as well. Certainly, if you're dealing with enterprise resource planning or customer relationship management, the amount of a sale, the amount of employee paycheck, the amount of a debit or credit still matter. But but I agree, those unstructured forms like photos, like videos, like just even if you look at a medical record, what they call the text blob. 85% of the data on a medical record isn't neat. It isn't your name and your social security number and your height and your age. It's the doctor's notes, and that's increasingly important and too big to ignore. I write about tools like sentiment analysis and text analytics that let doctors scrape that information in mass and see if you and I present with the same symptoms. You know, we're around the same age. We're both white men. Um, but maybe we have symptoms that could be applied to other people. In fact, um, one company that I've studied called Humedica proactively identified about 200 patients of theirs that hadn't been diagnosed with diabetes, but based on their medical records, were likely to have it. They called up those 200 people, and 85% of those, even though they hadn't been diagnosed, had diabetes. And I'm no expert on diabetes, but like anything else, it's better to know sooner rather than later. So that's just one example of the type of data that actually can be very valuable that isn't necessarily an address or a paycheck or a number. So that seems to speak to the issue of identifying the signal and the noise that, that you discussed in passing when you were talking about volume. And it, it feels like another implication of big data is, and once again, this is simultaneously an opportunity and a challenge, is that 
we now have more information out there than ever before that could conceivably point us towards some sort of an insight like what you just described. But at the same time, finding those needles in the haystack is, is a, it's a, an organizational challenge as well as a technological challenge. I'd argue that it's more of the former rather than the latter. The tools exist. To me, to me, the question is whether the organization is willing to embrace them, whether employees are willing to challenge long-held assumptions. For example, at Google, and there was a great article recently on, I believe it was the head of HR, Laszlo Bach, on Harvard Business Review, who wrote extensively about how at Google, work experience and grade point average do not correlate with performance in certain jobs. Now, to some people, that's totally counterintuitive, right? Well, of course we're hiring someone with experience, right? That just seems very natural to them. It's intuitive. Well, for certain positions, like marketing manager or communications expert, perhaps that matters. But for certain types of coders, maybe if you were a high school dropout, it means that you didn't like structure and you like to be creative. The point is that Google was willing to ask the question, and then a, more important, I'd argue, Andrew, adopt its business practice based on its findings. At Google, data is the lingua franca. At Netflix, where I recently spoke, they have data visualizations on the wall. They live and breathe data. Um, so to me, the tools exist, but the tools don't implement themselves. We're not living in uh, the world of the Terminators just yet. To me, it starts with the organization's understanding of the importance of information and then once they recognize that, perhaps they will look at their tools and ask themselves some pretty tough questions. Do we have the right tools? Do we have the right employees? Do we have the right culture? And if not, how do we get there? Um, yes, the tools are important, but I think that it's a little overstated to say it's all about the tools. Couldn't agree more. Um, sadly, culture change within an organization is oftentimes more difficult than simply acquiring a new set of tools. Let's, uh, let's spend a little bit of time talking about the third V, which is velocity, before, before moving on to some other interesting questions here. So velocity, I think, relates to the description of, of social media that you often hear, that it's sort of like trying to drink from a fire hose. Right. And there's just an incredible amount coming at you in almost real time. Could you talk a little bit about the potential opportunity afforded by that type of real-time information. I think about identifying trends, for instance, that are unfolding sometimes even before, before we're able to detect them in other ways. I think about tools like Google Flu Trends, things like that. Right. It feels like that's something that's qualitatively different from a lot of the data we used to work with. It is, although Google Flu Trends has been taking a lot of heat lately for listeners and, and viewers who don't know. Google Flu Trends about three years ago did a fundamentally better job predicting flu outbreaks based on search queries than the CDC, the Center of Disease Control. For the last couple of years, CDC has beaten Google, which is, um, I saw a New York Times piece a couple days ago that questioned whether or not big data really could take the place of more traditional data sources. Um, the jury is still out. Google does a very good job when it comes to data. but. You can go from, I would argue, anonymous to infamous very quickly because of velocity, because of things like Twitter and social media and everybody carrying around a smartphone. Uh, six months ago, no one heard of Justine Sacco. Have you heard her story? No. This is an amazing story. She worked in New York, I believe, as a PR vice president for a Fortune 200 company. And right before she took a trip down to South Africa, I did hear Justine is white. You probably heard this then, right? Yeah, yep, she tweets, and these are her words, um, going to South Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. And then she gets on a plane. Now, importantly, the plane did not have Wi-Fi. By the time she landed, the, tweet, the hashtag, has Justine landed, was trending on Twitter. Her company issued a statement and then subsequently fired her, and while I can't predict the future, I would argue that as long as I'm alive, when you query Justine Sacco, her tweet will show up, even though she deleted it, first in the Google search ranking. So the point is that there is this incredible speed with social media. To answer your question, um, there are things that you could determine through these uh, streams. Even going back 10, 15 years, Walmart was a very famous example. They found that in the Midwest, states like Oklahoma and Nebraska, when there was a hurricane warning, people went to the store and, for whatever reason, purchased inordinate quantities of, get this, strawberry Pop-Tarts and beer. Hmm. As a result of that, they changed their entire inventory system such that it was linked to the weather system. When there was a hurricane warning, the system would automatically increase the orders. 
of beer and strawberry Top Tarts. Now that's just an example of Walmart making a change in its own internal process based on information. I still don't know why. Maybe they don't know why. And to some extent, why doesn't even matter. But the point is that there are these um, strange correlations that will take place. And if we can take advantage of them, then we can understand our customers, our employees better, make more money, serve our humanity better, et cetera. Et cetera. So I agree. There is a tremendous challenge, but there's also a tremendous opportunity for organizations willing to make that jump. So the Walmart beer and Pop-Tart story, which I love, by the way, uh, two great tastes that probably taste great together when you're, you're homebound during the, the midst of a big storm. Um, that, that points me towards two use cases that I really see for big data, and I'm wondering if, if you could share your thoughts on these. It seems like that is an example of big data taking a massive amount of information and enabling us to discern trends that simply wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for both the volume of the data as well as the tools that can help us start establishing some of the correlations there. So it feels like that's one scenario. Another scenario has to do with the individual and has to do with, with how, as a, an individual generates this digital footprint of activity over the months, over the years, you can suddenly understand much, much more about that person and what people who share things in common with that person may also be interested in than we've ever been able to think about before. Could you talk to those two scenarios a little bit? Well, I would argue that they're really not two different scenarios. I would argue that when I'm tweeting or blogging or carrying around my iPhone and taking a picture or uploading a video, and I'm one of, I think you mentioned before, 40% of humanity, so I figure two and a half billion people, give or take, connected to the web. Facebook with 1.2 billion users, Twitter with 250 million users, Collectively, we're all generating a tremendous amount of data. The companies, I would argue, that are taking advantage of big data more than others can go from this massive amount of data in, to the individual level. Companies like Netflix understand exactly what their customers are watching. Facebook knows what its users are doing because, of course, you log in. Uh, Twitter knows what you're tweeting. It isn't terribly difficult to use a tool to say, basically, what does Google know about me? What does Twitter know about me? So to me, there's sort of two sides to the same coin. Uh, but I would agree, um, even if you don't have the individually identifiable information, you can make some, and you've been able to do this for years, you can make some very accurate assumptions based on just being part of a cohort or a demographic group, right? This isn't simply guys in Las Vegas. You know, <laughs> they're knowing that you're talking about men in Las Vegas, Perhaps they're white, live in a certain zip code. Based on that, you can figure out your mortgage, your income, what's going, you know, your hobbies. Um, you know, to tack, tack that onto search history, and some of the marketing firms out there can paint a pretty accurate portrait of what's going to appeal to you, even if they don't know your name and social security number and address. So the, I, I would argue that they are actually very similarly related. So it seems like you're suggesting that big data is both broad and incredibly deep. Which makes it is normal sense. Um, with with certain people. Now there are plenty of people who choose not to join Facebook, right? You, there's no law, and there are social networks like Diaspora that take social. Um, I'm sorry, that take privacy very seriously. There are search engines like DuckDuckGo that aren't trying to monetize you. So we just have to understand as consumers and citizens that we're making a deal with these companies. And Jaron Lanier writes about this in his new book, Who Owns the Future. He believes that we've sort of sold our souls, and we, for free email, we've given up all this information. Um, but as you know, um, there's always um, a positive and a negative side. One of my favorite technology quotes is from Melvin Kranzberg, who said, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. In other words, if Google doesn't charge me anything to use Gmail or search, or Facebook doesn't charge me anything to be a, a member, while these are publicly traded companies, they have fiduciary responsibilities to make money off of if you don't like that, then you can simply leave, and there are other email services. So I tend to take the uh, uh, mindset of if I'm not being charged anything, then I'm the product. I agree with that, but then in these conversations, and I, I certainly follow them reasonably closely as well, it feels to me like there's a systematic underestimation of people's capacity to make their own informed choices about the balance between what they're giving up and the value that they're getting. I mean, Facebook is obviously the poster child for, for um, depending on your stance, sort of a callous disregard of, 
of privacy and taking advantage of people who aren't necessarily as sophisticated about their privacy settings as anything else. But from my perspective, that is the only tool out there that has basically my social graph, my entire social graph, which which is now based on over 40 years of relationships, available to me globally in real time. And uh, I, I attach substantial value to that, and I'm actually okay with with them turning me into a product in some circumstances in order to be able to take advantage of, of that communications tool. Yeah, that, that's why I'm a big believer in transparency. I get a little frustrated when I hear about Google Cars um, mining open Wi-Fi networks for the purposes of maps, because to me that's very under the radar. Uh, no, most people don't read 12 page long end user license agreements or service level agreements, right? Um, I, in the book, argue that when, or, when faced with these dilemmas and the legitimate ones about security and privacy, it makes sense to explain to people in plain English exactly what you're doing. In fact, towards the end of the new book, I talk about data ownership, and it's not hard to imagine a scenario in which four or five years down the road, Andrew, much the same way that companies will compete about being green, right? We are environmentally friendly. I could see companies competing on the basis of being data privacy friendly. In other words, we're specifically not selling your information to third parties. Uh, with a company like Netflix, maybe they're doing that, maybe they're not. Um, I do think that there is opportunity for organizations to distinguish themselves based upon what they're doing and not doing with data. Think about it. if you and I both run companies and I'm selling data to data brokers and you're not, and you charge a little bit more, maybe it's worth it for some customers to pay a little bit more knowing that their information isn't going to be sold. It's also interesting that some of that is happening already simply because different countries tend to have such different stances towards online privacy. Yes. I mean, the EU in general is much more aggressive about online privacy than the US, and even within the EU, Germany is particularly aggressive about not letting Facebook and Google do some of the things that they do here without a second thought. So clearly these companies can function in a world in which they're having a, an imposition of, of privacy standards um, imposed upon them by the state, so clearly it still works. It's just it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all scenario. No, and I don't know if it ever will be. In fact, um, I think in the U.S., because the privacy is so sectoral, in other words, you have a set of regulations for healthcare, a set of, of regulations for financial services, for education, versus for what I understand in the U.K. or in Germany, like you said, it's much more holistic. Um, these companies will have to adapt, if not because it's the right thing to do, right, the carrot, uh, because if they don't, they'll get slapped, the stick. So... The phrase big data speaks to these, these masses of people who are active out there in the online world. And clearly, there's no theoretical upper limit of the number of people who could participate. My next question has to do with the possibility of there being a lower limit. And I'm asking you this because most of the people who are either watching the show right now or will watch it in its archival form in the future are representing institutions that have a a uh, defined set of, of alumni who we're trying to engage on behalf of our schools. Cornell has around 250,000 alumni. As far as I'm aware, the largest alumni populations that are out there are in the 500,000, 600,000 range at some of the Big Ten schools. Is there, a, is there a certain critical mass of population that you need to have for big data to be relevant to you? That's an interesting question. Um, perhaps. I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time trying to figure it out. In other words, if you had 12,994, I, I don't imagine that if you sign up that 12,995th person, all of a sudden now you're part of big data. Uh, in Too Big to Ignore, I spent an entire chapter not searching for the perfect definition of big data. One simply doesn't exist. I simply des describe its characteristics. Uh, so to me, I think that's more important. To touch on something you, you mentioned though before, um, Andrew, Right now, most of what we call big data, I would argue, we generate. But if you think about smart technology and the Internet of Things, and I close the book with this, the way things are going, more and more data will be passively generated by homes connected to the Internet, by refrigerators, by things that are in the background generating data. Um, so we ain't seen nothing yet. For those who think that, oh, you know what, we only have 50 or 60,000 alumni, that number will sort of taper off. I would argue that this notion of big data, not, not specific to alumni relations, but forget about just data actively generated because I'm tweeting or I update or I upload a photo to Instagram. Think about the data that our homes, our devices, our cars will be generating. 
Um, I would argue that not tomorrow or next month or next year, but fairly soon, the data that machines generate and can be analyzed will trump what we actively generate. And it feels like there's a, a middle ground even there with the emergence of wearable technology. So your Fitbits, your, yep. your Google Glass, all that sort of stuff. Right, and that begs the question, does it even matter? Right. Am I generating it with my Fitbit or is my Fitbit generating it? Well, who cares? It's still data and it's still relevant to you, right? It's my Fitbit or it's my set of Google Glass. If it can be relevant to me, if my device is aware of where I am, Right? Maybe mm -hmm. it can serve up, hey, Phil, did you know that that um, Mexican place you like is having a special? Here's a digital coupon. Or there's a happy hour. So um, it really are moving into this world. Again, it, it's happening faster and faster now in which we're constantly being surrounded by data. And it's something I mentioned in the beginning of the new book, The Visual Organization. We don't just access data when we're at work. Far from it. We are constantly consuming and generating data. Um, on our persons, um, sometimes even now with Fitbits when we sleep. Sure, sure. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got started thinking about big data initially? Were there any trigger events when you realized that, wow, things are different and we need to, we need to deal with this? Well, in the beginning of Too Big to Ignore, Andrew, I write about how, and I believe it was January of 2012, I was driving to a, um, an event in Las Vegas to see Nate Silver speak, and He's a very, as you probably know, popular and well-read data journalist. At one point, he was responsible for 20% of New York Times traffic. And I just said to myself, I keep hearing about big data. Why don't I go to a conference? Um, but to me, big data was sort of an offshoot of my fourth book, The Age of the Platform, when I talk about companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, and how they've really built out these ecosystems. Anybody can create an app in the App Store, I know, because I have one. You can upload books to Amazon. You can create apps for Google Play. You can embed Google AdSense in your website. Because of these platforms and how innovative they are and how they put a lot of tools in the hands of regular people, they generate an awful lot of data. So to me, this book was very much a continuation of the age of the platform. And uh, certainly events over the last two years have borne out the fact that big data matters. Whoever thought that with the PRISM scandal and the NSA, uh, President Obama ever would have publicly uttered the word metadata. Geeks around the world rejoiced. Yes, we've been noticed. Um, so there have just been a lot of things, but at, at a high level, as you pointed out before, I sort of sit at the intersection of technology, people, data, and management. And to me, big data isn't just a tech issue. The same way that companies these days are increasingly becoming uh, technology focused. You know, Nike now with Fitbit is becoming a technology company. The Gap has an app and it's a retailer. So I, I think that lines, as I mentioned before, are really blurring. And those, as I write in the book, who ignore big data do so at their own peril. That's right. And just ignoring it does not mean that it's not there. And your competitors may not be ignoring it and they may be establishing a competitive advantage because they're dealing with reality instead of burying sure. their head in the sand. We you're a smart guy. I like to think I'm not an idiot. If we can gather some money, we can get some people from Elance and build a bookstore. But we don't understand our customers as well as Amazon does. My publisher doesn't understand its customers as well as Amazon does. So why would we start a bookstore, even if we could? Or with Netflix, they understand their customers. They know what they're clicking. They know the colors of movies. They have this mass of data, and they're willing to use it. The last thing I would do is start an online video service. Um, their advantage to me is insurmountable. The same way you and I can start a search engine. I just think that the gap between the haves and the have-nots vis-a-vis data is expanding. And when I think about companies who aren't doing anything, I just say now is precisely the time to act. Just because your competition isn't doing anything that you shouldn't either. Now is the time to put some distance between yourself and your competitors. And I think you're actually you're drilling in right now the, the core value proposition. If we can take advantage of the data resources that are out there now to understand our constituencies better, yes, serve them more effectively on behalf of our institutions, which presumably then will pay dividends back in terms of, of ongoing engagement, of giving, of more, more of mind share, why in the world wouldn't we do that? You know, I'm, I'm no expert on academia. I just have a couple of degrees, but... I mean, when I think about the generic fundraising letter that I get, imagine if that could be tailored, right? Imagine if it weren't just a generic plea for cash. 
point where we noticed that you were very interested in technology or in the future of big data or whatever. Or that's a lot different than if I were studying at Carnegie Mellon, the arts and acting. What if there were a more personalized letter? I mean, look at Kickstarter. I would argue that Kickstarter is almost democratizing funding for the arts. Right? And um, Stephen Johnson writes about this in a wonderful book called Future Perfect. Rather than left versus right, conservative versus liberal, what if there were a more democratic form of government in which people could actually choose where their money went? But again, the technology is developing such that that's possible. Rather than just giving a bunch of money to a bunch of bureaucrats and they'll give it to whomever they see fit, imagine if we could directly participate in democracy. So um, I think about the implications of big data far beyond just making more money. I think about big data as a form of better government. In fact, in the book, Too Big to Ignore, I write about Street Bump, the Boston-based app that lets when you drive around with your smartphone and you bump at certain GPS coordinates and then you do it and I do it and a hundred other people do it. Well, by virtue of that, that's not a coincidence. Someone need not call up the Public Works Department and say there seems to be a, a pothole on 7-Eleven, right, near the corner of X and Y. It, you literally know where it is and resources can be deployed to fix that pothole immediately. To me, that transcends traditional political affiliations. To me, that's about getting government to do things in a better way. And given the state of our budget, who can really argue with that? All I can say is after a hard winter, I'm passionately hopeful that that technology comes to Ithaca as rapidly as possible. I'll make a call. All right. So let's talk a little bit about organizational readiness for big data. Um, how, does, how does an organization know that it's ready to take the plunge? They buy my books. Naturally, that's the first step. <laughs> and after that. Uh, in the book, I argue that it's important to be honest. And to me, Andrew, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. I think the worst thing that an organization can do is to earmark $500,000, a million dollars, try to get a little bit pregnant, not really be committed to it. It doesn't go anywhere. And they say, oh, yeah, we deployed to do it. We tried big data. It doesn't work. They didn't really try. I don't think there's anything wrong with honestly looking yourself in the mirror and saying, we're not ready yet. We don't have the financial resources. We don't have the human resources. Our culture just isn't oriented on data right now. What can we do in the next two years? What kinds of um, employees can we hire? What kind of decisions can we change? How can we make part data part of our DNA, a la Amazon, Apple, uh, Netflix, Google, Facebook? Um, I'd rather an organization did that or even started a small scale, for instance, with the advent of cloud computing, with software as a service, with open source software, you don't necessarily have to spend a million dollars. You can use sites like Kaggle, which I don't know if you've heard of that one. No. Kaggle's a fantastic hybrid of a social network and Kickstarter and Wikipedia, and you can run contests, whether you're a small company or NASA, which has a 15 I'm sorry, an $18 billion project, uh, budget, you can set a goal. We have a data set or we have a problem we're trying to solve. Here's a $50,000 prize. Now, for most organizations, that's not a tremendous amount of money. So you can get a little bit pregnant with big data. You don't need the entire organization to be on board. If you're in the marketing department and we're curious about whether you can move the needle with regard to LinkedIn or Twitter or social, um, Facebook social data, you can take that route without approval from the other parts of the organization. I'd much rather organizations were honest with themselves about whether rather than jump headfirst into something for which they're not ready for all sorts of reasons and then, oh yeah, big data didn't work for us. Well, you never really gave it a chance. It'd be like saying, I tried to golf once. I didn't do very well. Well, you never took a lesson. How did you think you were going to do? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more there and it's possible to spend so much money and so much time doing something poorly that it's always frustrating when you fumble the ball but it has nothing to do with with what you were trying to do. It has to do with your poor execution. And yeah, I, I do think that organizational readiness is one of the key things that um, I think inhibits a lot of organizations. I give credit to the ones that say, you know what, we're not ready yet, we'll try in a couple years, as opposed to ones that I mentioned before have spectacularly failed because they just they, they weren't ready for it. They're in my just as a an example, 15 years ago, long before I ever heard the, the term big data, I worked for a large pharmaceutical company in New Jersey, and I worked in human resources. A friend of mine said, "Hey Phil, I need your help. You're really good with numbers in Excel." Okay. Long story short, they were trying to assess the ROI or the um, 
business value of recruiting at Ivy League schools versus Rutgers State University of New Jersey. Now, by way of background, I went to Cornell. I have friends who went to Harvard and Columbia. So I'm not anti-Ivy League, but to me this wasn't a pro or anti-Ivy League decision. This was a business decision. Where are we spending our money and are we getting a bang for a buck? To make a long story short, I proved that we were spending a boatload of money, three to $400,000 for each Ivy League recruit, when that person stayed on average a year, a year and a half. Rutgers were spending far less money in terms of salary, in terms of recruiting costs, and those people were staying with us longer, they were being promoted, they were better long-term employees. When I presented those findings to the head of recruiting, his answer was very simple. But I like recruiting at Ivy League schools. It was good for his ego. And there's nothing wrong with that, but my point is don't ask the question if you're not willing to hear the answer. And I think that that applies times a thousand with regard to big data. If you firmly believe that you should always hire people with work experience and that GPA matters, maybe you're right, maybe you're not. But if Google is willing to ask that question, why aren't you? So to me, it is much more, I think that's the key point, actually. Yes, the tools matter, but individual, employee, culture, organizational readiness to me far trump that. As uh, Drucker once said, and I'm, I'm sure you know this quote, culture eats strategy for lunch. That's right, that's right. I think that's a particular danger for people who are working in higher ed advancement in that so much of our messaging, so many of our programs are very heavily laden with tradition. So you think about the fact that we invest so much effort in working with the classes and we invest so much energy in maintaining regional clubs and associations. And those are all organizational forms that have worked really well for us and for our constituencies for decades. But at the same time, I feel like, like by heading in a big data direction, we're, we're opening up a potential Pandora's box of suddenly realizing that there are other affiliations out there that may actually be more meaningful to our constituents and that that may help us understand why we tend to do incredibly well with a certain subset of our populations consistently, but then there are other, other segments out there for whom a lot of our conventional programs are falling on deaf ears. And if we're not, if we're not willing to accept the possibility that the data may tell us that there are things out there that are now more effective than classes and clubs, we may not have gotten anything out of our, our big data experiment. I would agree. Many people are afraid to turn over a rock. They don't know what they're going to find. I'm of the opinion that if there's something under there, why don't we find it as soon as possible, good or bad? Totally on the same page on that one, although I, I certainly understand that for people who've been stewarding these programs for, for sometimes decades, the prospect of that all of a sudden being decentered is a little bit... But, but I would argue, what's the alternative? I mean, again, I'm no expert in academia, but I also don't have my head in the sand. I mean, look at the popularity of MOOCs. Look at people like Peter Thiel paying smart 19-year-olds $100,000 to either drop out of school or never to go to college. Look at students graduating with you know, the tens or you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt. There are people these days that are questioning whether or not, I saw a Charlie Rose special on this with the, um, was the president of Harvard, and that was one of his for her. You know, mm -hmm. What about all of these potential threats? So the point is that it would be foolish for me to say that in 20 years, institutions of higher learning will continue to be able to charge 6% increases in inflation. I mean, at some point that may hit a limit. At some point there may be disruption. Innovator's dilemma, I think, is not, um, uh, I should say, immune to academia. Yeah, that's yeah. absolutely the case. And I think you can see that in a lot of our our longitudinal engagement statistics, especially with regard to things like like unrestricted giving among young alumni. It's just a slow, 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 steady decline, and I don't see that there's any reason to believe that that's going to turn around on its own. Mm -hmm. feels like we're being sort of backed into the corner of having to think about alternative ways of, of engaging these folks, because what we're doing is just losing effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the issue of hiring and looking for candidates who are going to work well in a big data environment. What sorts of traits would you be recommending that hiring managers look for as they try to identify people who can help an organization grapple with big data? I don't have any kids, but if I did, I would encourage him or her to become a data scientist. Um, there was a McKinsey report a couple years ago that showed that there was a dearth of roughly 180,000 data scientists in the United States. It's a very hot field right now. But beyond being a proper data scientist, to me, do you have some facility with numbers? Are you decent with technology? Um, do you represent it in visual ways? Do you make decisions based on... Um, if so, 
why not? Uh, why or if not, why not? That doesn't mean that intuition dies, but are you willing to do some basic testing? Um, to me, those are skills that I think are, are certainly going to be in demand in the future. Uh, there is an old guard, as I mentioned, that head of recruiting who didn't really want to look at data. Uh, but if you talk to millennials these days, I, a friend of mine is a 25, 26-year-old Google Analytics whiz. For her, the idea of not split testing or A-B testing something is completely anathema. Uh, even though we like to slam millennials as being slackers who sit on their sofas and eat cheaters, Cheetos, many of them are actually very familiar with data. And there's this initiative now, Code for America. I mean, we are, as uh, Dan Tapscott points out in his book, developing a very tech-savvy generation. Now that challenges the status quo, but uh, to answer your question, um, it doesn't, you don't have to be a statistician, but if the very thought of, idea, of data is repugnant to you, you're probably limiting your career potential and to pay off some of those student debts. It also feels like, like one of the main roles of a good data scientist is packaging the data in such a way that it makes it easy for for the medicine to slip down a little more easily. Um, yes. I think that, that actually takes us right to the, the topic of your new book, which is data visualization. Could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. In fact, I was just asked this question a few hours ago. Um, statisticians and data scientists have to be able to tell stories. CXOs won't necessarily care about the difference between a type 1 and a type 2 error or a confidence interval or a chi-square. Um, for them, it's, I think, important to be able to tell a story and to have the data behind it such that if somebody asks you, well, how are you sure about this or what was your methodology, you can explain it in plain English. Um, there's a reason that Malcolm Gladwell sells so many books. I would argue, as others have, that his science is at best flawed. He sort of cherry picks examples that fit his overall theory. Now, if that's the case, then why does he sell millions of books? Why is he, is he in every bookstore, in every airport I'm ever visiting? He knows how to tell a good story. Um, in terms of data, being able to visualize that, if you think about it, data viz, as someone mentioned in a blog post recently, is almost the front end of big data. In the new book, I write about how interactive tools let you ask questions of the data. They let you be curious. It's not simply about creating 100 standard reports that address really finite things. It's about creating a much more holistic view of the data, being able to ask questions of it, to interact with it, knowing that you won't necessarily go from point A to point B. You may wind up at point Z. But in the process, you'll be asking questions. So that's really the genesis of the new book. And companies like Netflix and the University of Texas and Autodesk and eBay are doing some really interesting things with big data. And not just in terms of storing it, but in terms of visualizing it and letting lay people, those who aren't proper techies, play with data. They don't want IT in the middle of it. They certainly don't want everybody going back to the IT department saying, can you add this? Can you add that? Can you answer this question? That's so 1998. Yeah, I've got sort of an ongoing fantasy that at some point some college or university will be brave enough to actually open up the non-FERPA protected data set of their entire alumni body to alumni themselves on the assumption that they are more likely to be able to discern needs and value in the alumni population than those of us sitting centrally, even though we spend all of our time thinking about this. And it's sort of analogous to how when Apple created the the App Store and then open that up to developers. It was it was right. up to the users to define value and then do something about it. Well, it's interesting that you mention that because I'm not sure if they do that with donations. But the University of Texas, I profile in the new book, and they make a tremendous amount of data available, not just to alumni or administrators or chancellors, but to anybody with an internet connection. You go go to the University of Texas productivity dashboard, and you can play with data. You can see what admission rates look like for uh, different demographics for PhDs in engineering. And there are all different ways to cut the data. And this gets to this notion of trend. And uh, yes, that's very akin to what Apple did with the App Store, with this sort of platform thinking, with Google Glass releasing it first to developers for $1,500 each. They want good ideas to come from the ground up, not necessarily everything from the top down. There certainly are good ideas from senior people, Steve Jobs being a case in point. But many people don't remember, for instance, with Twitter, which you're active on as well as I, the retweet button did not ship with Twitter 1.0, nor did the hashtag Chris Messina from Carnegie Mellon said this would be a really useful tool. And to its credit, Twitter now supports hashtags, although they can't really stop it. So there should be this, I would argue, mix of top-down thinking cathedral with bottom-up thinking the bazaar. 
Couldn't agree more. So we're getting on to having about 10 minutes left, and I was wondering if we could shift focus a little bit to talk about some of the main challenges associated with, with big data. OK. Um, you, you mentioned one before. You talked about the privacy issue. What are your thoughts on that? Ignore it at your own peril. Um, we saw what happened when um, you know, companies like Facebook and Google have been outed for having less than um, there's a was it, I think uh, Google had tweaked some code and they were tracking people in Safari a couple of uh, months ago. So I would argue that being transparent is probably a good thing, but privacy is a big one. Security is a big one. Uh, and many organizations, I would argue, they they just don't want to listen to data. They don't incorporate data in the decision making. I would argue that the limitations of big data and the challenges are as much, if not more, people-oriented than anything else. So to a certain extent, that feels like the, the thing you always hear about, password strength and password failure and how most of the security breaches associated with passwords are, are human failures, not right. failures uh, with the authentication system. Yeah, someone did a really interesting analysis a couple months ago after LinkedIn had ha was hacked, I think it was 20 million passwords were compromised, and they ran a simple count of the most common passwords, and I'm sure you can guess what the most common password was. Password. Exactly. Yep. Uh, so people will make mistakes like that, but it doesn't excuse companies for being a little careless with regard to their privacy. Just to understand that when people talk about big data and privacy, there is nothing that's 100% guaranteed. And that includes keeping your data completely offline in your home, filing cabinet with my financial records or my business records, and there's a fire or a theft or a flood. So this notion that there's 100% privacy anywhere, I think, is misplaced. Well, it sounds like people are a little bit uneven in, I guess, their, their senses of how much privacy they want is contextual, and that there are some scenarios in which they claim they want absolute, undisputed privacy, but at the same time, if they go to Amazon, they want to be getting those push emails notifying you that the new book by John Sanford is coming out time, sometime soon or something like that. Right. We're fickle beings. I, I read two books. So one is You're Not So Smart, and the other one is You're Not So Dumb. And anyone who's taken a psych class in college <laughs> probably touched upon availability bias and hindsight bias and selection bias. But I find it interesting, this era of technology, how we're, we're often hypocritical as human beings. Like you said, we want complete privacy but the benefits of not being so private. So um, I tend to think of it less as a sort of binary, more as a continuum. Uh, I can have very strong opinions on one end, but typically when I talk to someone on the other end, they're just making a personal choice. And I would argue that, as I mentioned before, no one forces you, and it says a different matter, and I don't want to get off point, but no one forces you to use Google. There are other search engines. No one forces you to use Facebook or LinkedIn. So these companies, if you think Think about it. If you ran marketing for Target and had access to data that could figure out what your customers wanted to buy, and Amazon was turning your thousands of stores into showrooms, wouldn't you use that information to move your needle? I think it's sort of naive for people to say, well, I'm just above it. Well, your role would dictate that you have to use that information, hopefully in a responsible way. But why you would want to ignore a trove of data that relevant for the purposes of giving people more of what they want is beyond me. And that actually leads into a question that I think it would be great to wrap this conversation up with. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between big data and organizational strategy? It feels like, like there have been times in the past where data is viewed as sort of an ancillary thing that lets you fine-tune your marketing a little bit more effectively. But what you were just describing is a much more fundamental transformation of the organization. Yeah. In my opinion, Andrew, the companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Netflix have fused the two. Big data is very much part and parcel to their organizational strategy. When I hear about a big data strategy apart from a business strategy, I just roll my eyes. Um, these days is being quantified, and if it isn't, it will be soon. Uh, to me, to have the most success in this era of big data, apart from buying one of the books, I think it behooves organizations to understand that this isn't just an IT initiative or an IT project. Big data really should be part of decision making. It doesn't mean that individual intuition goes away. In fact, um, in the most recent book I described Netflix and how in its decision to spend $100 million on 13 episodes of House of Cards, big decision, right? They weren't certain that it was going to work out. They had no idea they were going to win an Emmy. But they had the data 
to justify that decision and make that risk actually very manageable. And it wound up being a very successful one, but I, they bought that show without a pilot. They don't do that in Hollywood. Typically, and I'm no expert, you have to have a pilot, right? Netflix has the data that obviated the need for a pilot. And even if you watch the pilot, you get the opinion of three or four people. Well, contrast that with NBC circa 1991. My, one of my favorite shows of all time is Seinfeld. People forget that Seinfeld was almost canceled after six episodes. It was called the Seinfeld Chronicles. Some executive at NBC said, I don't care about the ratings. I like it. It's funny. And now it's an iconic show and has been around for a long time. It'll be in syndication when you and I are chatting on Google Hangouts or the equivalent when we're 70. But uh, it doesn't mean that intuition goes away. But what if you could augment it? Wouldn't you make a better decision? So I would close by saying that in terms of big data and organizational strategy, put the two together. What if big data could augment what you're doing? It doesn't mean that intuition goes away. It just means that your intuition may, in fact, be better. Not everything can be quantified, but why not take advantage of what you can quantify? Uh, one of my favorite quotes in the new book is from James Barksdale, who was one of the co-founders of Netscape. If we have data, let's use that. Otherwise, let's use my opinions. <laughs> that is a perfect note to end on. Phil, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's amazing how fast an hour can pass when you're having fun, and I really appreciate your spending this time with us. Uh, once again, thank you to our sponsor, iModules, for making this possible. Thanks to those of you who tuned in live. And as always, you can watch more shows from Advancement Pros on the Advancement Live Archive located at higheredlive.com. Thanks to everyone who tuned in live, and see you next time.